know, it's really our heart today. And no matter where we are, the good seasons, the tough seasons of life, it's always good to look to the Lord. And as we take a few moments to do exactly that and go to God's Word, just want to say again just how grateful all of us are that we have family and friends. Some of you have come from another place in our country, another church. My guess is you've had people reach out to you this week. And what a blessing that is, isn't it? That people say, hey, are you okay? Do you have a need for anything? And we've been overwhelmed as a church with people that have come to us, just showed up to help. And again, we want to be, we want to be a place that's ministering to others. And I wanted to just mention, they're not asking for this, and I didn't know they'd be with us today, but so grateful for Samaritan's Purse, the Billy Graham Association. We have two of them who are here, and their friend, Denise, would you stand for just a moment as we welcome you to our service? What a great blessing that is. Thank you so much. Will Graham had come by our church campus yesterday. Many of you give to Samaritan's Purse, and uh, it's a Christ-centered ministry. And so all of us know what it's like uh, to have the joy of giving to others in their time of need. And it's a joy to know that they are there for us uh, in our community's time of need. I was thinking a, a lot about the story that I saw this week. It was a headline from Putman County, and we are thoughtful of them because they experienced the most uh, death and so much of the, the main force of the winds of the tornado. There was a headline that said that a Bible had been found that was untouched. Officer Ditton with the Sparta Police Department said, quote, there's not a page gone in this Bible. It's a family Bible, and we'd like to find out whose family Bible it was. Matter of fact, they said they went on to discover there are a lot of Bibles. They don't know who the owner of the Bible is and those Bibles uh, belong to. But they were amazed at how virtually every page in the book was intact. And I want to remind all of us what God's reminded me of this week, and that is this, that there's not a page in his word, there's not a promise that he's made, that God will ever fail in keeping to his people. Amen. And all of us, by faith, are the owners to that word. It is the Lord's word, but he's given that to us as his people. And there's a lot of places we could go this week to God's Word, and we all need comfort and encouragement, and that's what we want to do as believers. And I thought, I wish there was a book in the Bible that spoke about brokenness, a deep need for God. If there was only a story in the Bible that talked about rebuilding and the need for leadership, <laughs> I racked my brain and prayed all week, Lord, if there could just be something that would talk about how you are with us, you're faithful. You're not only the master builder, but the master of rebuilding. If there was only such a book, we would turn to it. And so with that, would you turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 9? <laughs> it's a little bit different today because of what we've all experienced. But the word is no less true. As God's people are looking to him and the brokenness of their lives, in Nehemiah chapter 9, they just begin to fast and to seek the Lord and confess their sin. And I know that may seem strange to you, but whenever heartache comes into my life, you know, one of the intuitive questions that I at least want to ask is this, Lord, in what way do you want to cleanse my life and draw me closer to you? Have you sensed that this week? Lord, I want to be ready to go. If you were to take me today, I want to be ready to go. Lord, I want to just be close to you. And there's nothing more important than that. And God's people come together, and they were seeking him because he had brought them to a place where they never thought they would be again. They were there right within the city walls of Jerusalem. If we know where they had come from, we would know that it was a miracle that God, that had led them away, had brought them back in, and here they were right before God. And the Bible says there in verse Five, that all of these men that were leading God's people, the Levites, said, Stand up and praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. You know, the interesting thing about that phrase is that it comes from Psalm 90 in verse 2. 
In my Bible, it's headed off that this is from a man named Moses. Somewhere back in that time of the patriarchs, going to that time of captivity and the great deliverer of Moses, Moses felt the need, what all of us will throughout our lives, and that is this, that when life is uncertain, from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. So he's faithful, and the thing that we want to turn our hearts to is then what Nehemiah and these men were looking at in the rest of this story, and we don't have time to cover it all, but I want to give you at least this to pray and to consider in your heart like mine, and that's this, the path forward in the time of a storm and how we could trust God's Word as we move forward. And I want you to look with me at three phrases. One is in verse verse 7, the second is in verse 9, and the third is in verse 13. And I've never shared this passage before in this way and taught it in this capacity or for such a time as this. By the way, we are all here for such a time as this. I talked to a man, James, who was baptized in our church last Sunday. And here he is today at a new location. Aren't you grateful we are not confined by the walls of a building? And here he is, worshiping, turning to God with his wife and his family the Sunday after he's baptized. And whether we're a new believer or a seasoned believer, look at these three phrases. Number one, verse seven, you are the Lord God. Verse nine, You saw the suffering. And verse 13, you came down. You are the Lord God. You saw the suffering, and you came down. And in the history of God's people, the Lord takes them back through his faithfulness. And all of us want to remember God's promises. None of us intend to be ungrateful or unaware of God's ways. But life has a way of testing all of that. You might say, for most of us, the question could be, do we believe in God's promises more today or less compared to last Sunday? We might even ask it in this way. If you believed in the certainty of God's word last week and who God is, do you believe it as much this week or have you changed it a little bit? I want to believe that in my heart, I don't believe it as much as I believed last Sunday. I believe it more. That there's not a thought that I've had this week, even in the grief of loss and the anxiety of next steps and the overwhelming sense of what we've all walked through where I thought less of God and his purposes. And here's why, three statements just to give to you and your heart from this passage, because God is a promise keeper. God keeps his word. And the Bible says here that as he's reminding his people of who he is, that he is the Lord God. And there's that word covenant in verse 8. You can circle that because the Bible says that it was the Lord God who chose Abram. Uh, He would become Abraham and brought him out of the Ur of the Chaldeans, and then he named him Abraham. And you found his heart to be faithful to you. That is not that Abraham was perfect. He was a sinful man that needed a Savior. But inasmuch as all of us can, we have the opportunity to respond to God's promises. Abraham did. Would you highlight that last phrase in verse 8? You have kept your promise because you are righteous. You could take that personally in your life, that God will keep his promise to you because he is righteous. And we know that he is righteous despite how we feel and how we view things and where we are. He is always faithful. And that word for covenant speaks to us that with all of the times that God had called his people, whether it was Abraham, whether it was the other patriarchs, they were many times faithless. But God was always faithful. And our hope today is that as we pull together and we think of one another and our neighbors and people who do not know Christ, tell you the hardest thought that I've had this week is not just for us who've lost so much but we know Christ what about those who do not know God and now they're really going to be struggling may God use us to minister to them and to share with them the love of Jesus not because we have all the answers but because we believe in the God that saved us from our sin and we know that the creator of this world has been faithful to his purposes for all times but we also are reminded 
of just how insecure this world can be. The greatest foundations can be affected. I marvel, just like you, at the forces of the wind and how much damage can take place just right before our very eyes. It's like you go to bed and you wake up to a different world and there's something about just seeing the rubble of all of that that just causes you and stirs you to a very vulnerable place. And then we look to the God who created us. And the Bible teaches us one day is going to restore all things. Our hope is that this world as it is isn't left on its own, but that God is going to be accomplishing his purposes. And I love that the Lord for all of eternity knew the point of Tuesday early morning through Mount Juliet and from, from Nashville, our city, all the way through Cooksville, Putman County. The Lord sees it all. But his promises are true, and if God's not a promise keeper, well then we'll never turn to his word. But his word tells us again and again that we could trust his heart. I had a friend who said to me, and he's really a mentor, and he's been a minister for a long time, probably 40 years. He's walked through a lot of heartache and hurricanes and other places where he's ministered before. And When you're ministering long enough, you see a lot of heartache and pain. He said, Philip, the Lord in the middle of trying to come up with something to say to my people the first Sunday after a, uh, a horrifying, tragic incident. He said, I struggle for the words, and it's like God gave me this, that God is so good that he can be doubted. But we will find as we follow him that he is so good, he's also able to be trusted. And as we try to trust him, that doesn't mean that we have all the answers. It means this, that the Lord is in control and that our lives are in his hands. And I don't know about how you feel, but for me, I just want to say again, Lord, let my heart be right with you. Let me look at the right things in life for security and safety, and it is found in you. And none of us are more deserving or less deserving than someone else. We all feel that today. But according to God's purposes, some have been hurt more than others. But he loves everyone, and I love this verse to remind us on that note in verse 9. He sees the suffering. God keeps his promises, but God's promises are especially good whenever you're in pain. Sometimes whenever life is hurting, we think, well, God, I'm not so sure you're going to be as good in this moment. But you know, there's a comforting verse back in Exodus that says this, that when God's people had been in captivity all the way under Pharaoh, some 400 years, that God has sent them a deliverer named Moses. And I don't want to miss a word of this. The Bible says that when Moses was called by God to be the deliverer of his people, during that long period, listen to this, the king of Egypt died. God didn't die. Rulers come and go. Kingdoms come and go. Peoples come and go. But the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And the Bible said, says that the Israelites groaned in their heart. Why? Because they were in slavery. They cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. You know, there's a psalm that says this, that God bottles our tears. Maybe in quiet moments, you don't want anyone else to see your tears. You want to hold it together. I've discovered along the way, even the toughest of people will have vulnerable moments and cracking moments. And somehow, if nobody else sees it, you know who sees our tears? God. Now, the psalmist says that he bottles up our tears. And I love that here in slavery, when people were asking, where is God in this moment? Their cry went up to the heavens. And verse 24 of Exodus 2 says, God heard their groaning. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. I believe that the Lord all week long has heard the cries of his people. He has seen the heartache and his heart is moved towards that pain. And his promises in that moment is a reminder that if we can ever trust God in life, we could be sure that we can trust him whenever life becomes fragile and as we know it upended in the way that we say is normal. God sees pain. He's attracted to it because I think that in those moments, we kind of are reminded how much control we have. 
Uh, I don't feel like I have as much control at my age now of life. I don't feel like I'm as in control of my life now of my age than I did 20 years ago, I could tell you. And some of you probably will say, well, Philip, if the Lord lets you live long enough, you're not going to feel that you have any more control in 20 or 40 years from now either. For those of you who don't know, we have Rutland Place on our campus. And we have about 90 plus seniors that call that place home. It's a beautiful facility. And after the tornado had come through, we were checking on them, and there were those checking on the church and all of our other ministries, MJCA. Brig, I think you were the first person on campus to respond to the tornado. It wasn't even safe. He was just walking around the building. And there were others that just showed up. And we go over to Rutland, and we think, well, what are we going to find with these dear seniors? The path of that tornado had turned just so much. Brother Clint and Tom, those of us, we walked in together. It was as if it was just spared. There were some trees and debris and a window up in the front. But that was it, except for the electric. And I thought with 80 and 90-year-old, even senior saints, it would be pandemonium in there. But it was quiet. It was just peaceful. And here was my thought. I guess if you live to be 90, you've seen it all anyway, so what's the tornado? You'll just go back to bed. I guess they just went back to bed. Some of them probably had to be informed, you know. A tornado came through. I think others probably said, uh, well, wake me up when the electric's back on. And I think that for all of us, just like that, we're trying to find the Lord. All of us respond to things differently, and God knows that. But I think he wants us to be seeking him. I read as much as I could this morning of God's word for my own heart. The Bible says that the Lord loves those that love him. We don't love God with a perfect love, but he loves us with a perfect love. And the rest of that verse says this, that his heart is turned towards those that seek him, that if we seek him, we'll find him. You ever see that game in a sporting event with baseball? They'll have this that little moment throughout the game, and if you're in the park, you'll see the, the baseballs in the cup, and they'll, at the beginning, move that baseball around, and you've got to figure out where the ball is in the cup. You know what I mean, that game? And at the beginning, your eye is trained, and they'll just slowly move the ball from one cup to the other, and so far, so good. But then they get really uh, quick on that. And by the time that ball ends, it's just going everywhere. And then the goal of the game is to be able to say, I've still kept my eye on the ball, and I can tell you where it is. Life sometimes, uh, with our faith, is like trying to keep our eyes on God whenever everything else is moving on us. But God wants us to be those who find him. God's not trying to play hide and seek. He wants us just to seek him, and when we do, he will be found. That is the promise of God's word. And whenever it feels like that in life, we're reminded, though, that God sees our suffering. I want you to notice something quickly in this passage. You can go back later. They're going to find the word you, 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 you throughout this passage because God wants us to know that he is the author of life. He is the beginning and the end. He's our creator. He's our deliverer. Life is about him. Everything else can go, and we're kind of reminded, God, I can live without a whole lot of things that I may not want to live without, but I can make it just fine if I have you. And uh, buildings could be rebuilt, but relationships are eternal, and God calls all of us again to say, life is about you, Lord. It's you, it's you, it's you. And a final thought for us as we kind of go to a final time of prayer today is that verse in verse 13, you came down on Mount Sinai. You say, well, what does that have to do with God's word? Well, it has everything to do with God's word, and it speaks to us of the fact that God's promises save us. Because in verse 13, the Bible speaks there of that event for which God gave his people the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And the miracle of it all is verse 13, and God spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations. He talks about the law. And God gives us direction. God always gives. It may be day by day. You ever notice that in the Psalms, the Bible says that the word of God, it's like a what? A lamp unto my feet. It's a light into my path. 
It's not a floodlight. It's day by day, the daily bread of God, depending upon Him, one step at a time. Can we ask for permission as a ministry team to give prayers and wisdom and grace as we take a couple weeks to try to seek God in a short term and find a plan for what we're going to be doing? We're grateful to have this campus today and uh, we, we also have the blessing of being in here next week, but nothing's a guarantee. We are the guest of uh, this school. We're very grateful again to Principal Rainey and for her staff for making this available. But I just want to impress upon you that we don't have a bunch of answers. We do have, like you, a lot of questions. And I will tell you some encouraging news that in as much as we can be a- able to say we've done all we can up to this moment after a disaster, we have. Thanks to you and so many who pulled together, we've tried to make the campus clean and starting the work of making it safe and the uh, insurance adjuster has come but it could be according to them two to three months of just assessing the details of the damage they have to send out a team if you see some parts of the facilities and you say well that looks good from the outside well just just know that there's a lot of things on the inside that doesn't convey what's going on on the outside in certain portions of the facilities But we need God's word, and ultimately what I love about this passage is that God who loved us was never distant from his people. He comes to us. You ever wonder why Moses had to go up on the mountain? Uh, Because he's mortal man, sinful man. The Bible says in the same way Moses goes up to the mountain, God comes down. And that's an act of grace. And in our pain and suffering, the Bible teaches us that it's Jesus, God comes down from heaven to meet mortal man in our pain and our suffering and in our sin and he shows us the way and the biggest question is this will we have a right heart to respond to God the Bible says that his people were oftentimes uses two words arrogant and stiff neck and you might say well I I think everybody is open to the Lord at a time like this I wouldn't be sure of that. Sometimes pain has a way of hardening hearts. I want to pray that God doesn't let your heart or my heart get hardened. But at a time for when things happen to us, we could say, God, I'm going to believe that you're still doing a work, and we're going to trace your hand. We're going to follow you one day at a time. And church family, if we can open up our hearts like that, I think God will be glorified. I really believe that the Lord will let that light shine in our community and that God will do a great name and a great work for himself. Tragedies give us perspective. And one of those things is what really matters and one of the other aspects of that is how well we see God. Would you just say in your heart, I want to be open to the Lord. Can we with a raised hand today just say, for all of us in agreement, God, we just want our hearts to be open. Can you do that with your hands raised? I want my heart open. And as we walk graciously, we're going to try to communicate with you as a church family the best that we know how. But we're going to need a lot of grace, your prayers, your wisdom, and really your permission to be able to move forward. I believe God wants to show up, and he already has, and to reveal himself to be strong on behalf of his people. I just believe that about the Lord. And I believe that uh, you believe this. And as we move together and pray, we're just going to keep coming together. We're going to fill out some of the other questions that we have and give other destruction. But right now we get today. And today we get to say, Lord, we gathered together. We didn't fail you here on Mount Juliet. The storm came and we still said that in the calm and in the storm, oh no, you will never let us go. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's where I want my heart to be. I want us to have a moment, and I want uh, uh, Brig Thompson to come head of school and communicate and to pray in this moment for us. But part of our ministry going forward is making it a priority that the school gets to meet. We are fortunate that the elementary building had withstood a lot of the damage. And I want to tell you that because we're dealing with children and families, and we want to communicate as much as possible Uh, that we have a a plan and they're working the administration on that plan Uh, and I want you to hear from him in this moment and then we're going to have a another word 
of prayer. By the way, I think we mentioned it, uh, never know where life takes you. On this day, we have a team of people from our church family in Peru ministry. So would you remember to pray for them? But there's a lot of things that are still going on, taking place, and uh, Briggs, share with us just kind of what we need to know in terms of prayer and support and the next steps for MJCA. First off, I just want to say I, thank you. I, I've seen so many of you on campus this week, your, your friends, family members, strangers that saw work going on on our campus just pulled off the road. When you, when you go through something like this, the tragedy that we've all dealt with, you know, when the daybreak came on Tuesday morning, you could really see the damage. It was, it was, it was overwhelming. So as, we're, as we were discussing, should we close the campus or not? Is it even safe for people to come? Can we put people at risk? The calls were coming in so much. We want to help. We want to help. We just said, you know what? Let God's people be God's people. And what went on on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday of this week uh, before we just had to say, Hank, we got to, we got to stop for a few minutes was nothing short of a miraculous sign from God of just, I have you. These are my people. This is what we do. When you looked out over our campus, this video that played a few minutes ago, I couldn't help but like many of you, just tears were streaming down my face, but far less for the bricks and sticks that were destroyed for the people that were there contributing, Amen. doing everything that they can carrying bricks and logs and sticks and rubble even with tears in her face on coming down their own face while they're doing that that's what that's what got me that's the church that's god's people that's what we do so we've been through a lot we're going to still have a lot to go through we were fortunate enough that our elementary building uh, the children's building was was spared so we'll be able to get that one up going the quickest but still pray for uh, uh, God's wisdom and direction and provision on the rest. Uh, we're going through off-site locations right now, visiting many places. Just about every church in this community has reached out to us and said, how can we help you? We have space. We have people. We have supplies. What do you need? What a blessing that is. Amen. Amen. It's just been so, so heartwarming to see that this week. So I would just uh, say that we need your prayers for, for just God's provision and discernment and wisdom and guidance as we make next steps forward. We want, to get, we want to get school going as fast as we can. We're doing everything we can. Um, this next week is spring break for us right now, so that gave us a few more extra days. So after that, the Monday after spring break, we're going to have school going again. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. The school leadership team and many teachers haven't really stopped working since Tuesday on making sure that that happens. Uh, they love those kids and, and they want to do everything they can. Mm. So we appreciate your prayers. We have a lot to do in, a, in just a short amount of time, but uh, we're going to get it done. And uh, we, we, uh, we want to get this school going as fast as we can. Amen. Well, before, before we pray, Bray, I'm going to throw a, a wrench in the plans here. Uh, but I, I just want to do this. If you're, you teach at MJCA, have children at MJCA, hear from MJCA, have an affiliation with the school, would you stand for just a moment? God bless you. Church family, can we communicate our love for these families and teachers and faculty who are here? We love you, and we're going to pray with you and for you. Greg, let's lead a, a word of prayer here for them. Father God, we thank you for these moments that we have to celebrate who you are, to celebrate your promises that do never fail. God, we see the damage that was done, and we can't help but thank you for it coming in the middle of the night. All of us have those thoughts, just the what ifs. But God, you're our biggest what if because we know how much you love us, how much you provide for us. Father, we know that you know what our campus is going to look like in the next few weeks, in the next few months, in the next few years. And we just pray that we continue to seek your will for our campus, for our school, for our church. Lord, I thank you for the friendships that have been made and, and, the, and the memories even now, even now through the rubble, the memories that are taking place, the excitement about the next season because it is your next season. Father, I just continue to pray for these teachers who pour so much of their lives into our students. 
that they have to see their classrooms just completely destroyed. Many of them have a lifetime of work that was erased through water and damage. Father, just pray now that you continue to lift them up and give them peace in their hearts to know that it's time for new memories and new things to take place in their lives. It's not about the building. It's about who we are. It's about who you are. And it's about how we love. Father, just pray that you continue to support this beautiful, beautiful ministry that you've given this church over the last 40 years that will now only continue to grow in a mighty, exciting way of the next new and beautiful season that you have kicked off for us. And we look to you for our ultimate guidance. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you read this chapter later, this is what the Bible says about God. Therefore, you did not desert them. They lacked nothing for 40 years in the wilderness. Because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them. They reveled in your great goodness. Wow. May the Lord give us that kind of an experience with him. I believe he's already doing that. I really do. There are so many that have served church family, all of you. I just wish that I could stand at the door and hug every one of your necks, but you don't want to wait on me, and I know that. But I want to say that your ministry team this week, we all were eager to see your faces today. Many of them uh, didn't have electric, couldn't get to their own houses, houses damaged, and still showed up every day just to serve and to minister to you. I just want you to hear that and to know that. What a joy to be part of this church. And uh, we've got love. We need to pull together. And I believe this, that we're not victims. We serve a great God. And that the Lord has some incredible things ahead. Right now, we're hurting. We can talk about that later. But for our purposes today, just to brag on God, just to see you show up, just for us all to be together. How wonderful, how wonderful, how wonderful. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being here today. God is worthy of that.